I will quickly bring our guests on board because you know, um, not Jomu Soloku. <laughs> That's Yoba saying that we don't have too much time to waste. All right. So I'll quickly bring our guests live here with us. Then we have brilliant money ideas from okay, Israel Raj, Raji from Ikere Ekiti. Thank you so much. And then we have Fantona Isaac from Ife. Okay, he said I'm live. All right, great. Um Okay, yeah, wow. Thank you for the Richard card. Okay, Azin was Sandra won it. Wow. <laughs> this is our Google Skills trainer. She won the you are going to refund us the Richard card. <laughs> All right. Okay, anyway, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Um, so you are welcome once again. Let me bring our guest live with us right now. Is in the studio. You're welcome, sir. They are all seeing you live right now. Oh, guys, so, um, like I said, this is a Kitty Digital Summit. Let us know where you are joining us from. And if you have any question, right, if you have any question, try to drop it in the comment section, especially 45 minutes or when we call for it, so that your question will not have disappeared with other comments, okay? And more so, I, like I said earlier, um, if you are watching us live right now, it is absolutely free. But once you don't attend the live session like this, then you have to upgrade to the VIP class of Ikitidikta Summit to get access to the replay, and that is just for 5,000 Naira, okay? So we have our guest, like I told you, is a master strategist, is a business coach, right? And <laughs> this is someone that I really respect a lot. I first came in contact with him on Facebook, and then from there, I attended Thinking School, and you know, since then, we have been having a wonderful relationship. Okay, so guys, um, he's here with us and he's going to start his session right away. You're welcome, sir, and you have the floor right now. Uh, thank you very much, Ashola, for that um, beautiful introduction. Uh, okay, without taking um, too much time, you know, uh, the topic we are looking at is a very broad one, and we we need to, you know, uh, I, I, let me apologize first because I'm going to take it real fast and i hope that you would be able to pick um you know a few things along the way that can help you you know in the line of your business so um real quick uh, the topic is restrategizing your business for the digital economy um in the course of this presentation uh, we're going to do it's about 12, 12 slides but out of the 12 slides we're going to be um conversing for about 40 minutes and then we'll take questions um thereafter Okay, so this is a bit about me, but I guess that's already in the profile. Uh, so let's can just keep, but I need to quickly do this. Um, credit to Angela Fatuashi for putting this together like on very, very short notice. So the topic that we're looking at is re-strategizing your business for the digital economy. And so we're gonna take um, definitions first. Now, what exactly is a digital economy? And so um, I did a bit of, of research into what the digital economy means. And I found that um, digital economy refers to um, a, a broad range of economic activities that leverage on uh, it at all intangible concepts, intangible tools, such as digitized information uh, and knowledge, uh, the relevant tools and platforms as key factors of production and of service. Now, the digital economy in itself creates benefits and opportunities and also facilitates efficiencies uh, um, using digital technologies where the digital technologies begin to drive uh, innovation, it first job opportunities, scales profit, and provides economic growth for not just the business, it provides economic growth you know, for the society, for the individuals that are also um, involved. One thing that we do know for sure is that we all knew that uh, eventually we would need to come into this digital economy. Um, for, for those of us that are kind of um, futuristic that like, um, you know, been thinking and processing what's the next phase of innovation, what's the next phase of, of development for the human race, we, we, we foresaw, you know, that we would enter into that space where remote work would become the norm. We would enter into that space where it would become normal for you to have um, teleconferencing concepts, for you to have meetings online, for you to, you know, most of the things that we do now uh, they were projected to happen in about 10 years' time. Not because the tools were not in existence, but because, particularly in Africa, we are usually late bloomers. We, we adapt to 
to technology to advancement really um, late, but we tend to also adapt really fast. So our projection at the time, uh, I remember I made this presentation in um, Futa sometime in 2014, when I was talking about um, the future of relationships and the future of the labor market. And uh, that, that, that was at that time, we, our, the projection was that we would get there by 2030. But you see, COVID had, has moved the date. Now, what we have found now is that because of the restriction in human interaction, we are now forced to move from what was supposed to happen in the future and bring them now into the present. I remember in 2017, 2015 to 2017, when I had um, a conversation with some of my colleagues, uh, some my friends, and I said to them, hey, let's take this conversation um, you know, to, to Zoom. As of 2017, so many people did not even know that the word was Zoom. So I had to start walking them through, okay, you can do this on Zoom, you can do that. But now everybody knows Zoom. Not just Zoom alone. You know, there are different platforms. Right now we are using StreamYard, other, uh, you know, there is um, Clubhouse. There are just so many options now with specific um, efficiencies, specific tools to help you to have your meetings and to, you know, do the work that you need to do more effectively. And that is um, the kind of impact that COVID has had on technology, has had on the economy. Now, I'm going to be taking it uh, um, a step further by saying that the entire um, conversation is an ecosystem. So when we talk about digital economy, oftentimes we tend to just think about the internet, the World Wide Web, we think about teleconferencing, we think about social marketing, social media marketing, we think about um, you know other issues that, yes, play a role in the digital economy. But you see, the digital economy in itself is within an ecosystem, and that is what we need to understand for businesses now, let me also quickly say that here that it is not sufficient for us to say um, uh, you, 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 you now have digital um, tools, digital comp competencies as part of your business. No, it is no longer um, right to say it is a part of your business. Your business must be built on those digital competencies. You know why? Because it is now um, an entire ecosystem. So you talk about a currency, there's a digital um, currency. Even for the regular currency that is backed by nations of the world, there are now digital components of those same currencies. So uh, it's now possible for you to run your entire business from start to finish, open an account, do your business with whoever you want to do business with all over the world without ever stepping into a banking hall. That is how liberalized and digitized the world is right now. How, that's how the economy is. That's how your business. So, so you can no longer say that... Um, digitization is a component of your business. No, your business must be built on the concept of digitization. Um, there's a lot of movement now against tree felling. There's a lot of movement against so many things, um, combustion, um, climate change. It's an entire ecosystem. And there's, a, there's a huge shift that is happening, uh, which we are not um, you know, catching up with fast enough. So, um, so when we talk about an ecosystem, to bring it down, to simplify it further, is we are basically talking about a digital economy, a digital community, rather. And part of a digital community is economy. Now, I'm going to give a very, like, an oversimplified example. If I want to sell products in equity state, for instance, it is not sufficient for me to just look at who are my competitors in equity state, um, what are the kind of products that they want, or the kind of brand that people of the state want to want to um, you know buy or use i need to ask myself what is the culture of equity uh, um you know on a, on a lighter note i remember um so about, about two weeks ago someone was asking would the jury system work in nigeria and the response it was on social media and the response was that which jury that they can sentence you simply because you did not greet them and that's you know as funny as that may sound it the truth of the matter is that it's it's a reflection of our culture the same thing with the digital community. There's a culture of the digital community. And that is why you'll find that oftentimes you'll find a lot of friction between two, three generations. You'll find the, um, the baby boomers, the, the generation X, the generation Z, you know, all of them, there's a lot of friction because the culture is shifting. And uh, most of the older generation, uh, you know, like myself, <laughs> most of the older generation are trying to bring the traditional culture, the respect, the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the concept of privacy, you know, we're trying to bring all those culture that we have on, in the real world, trying to bring them into the digital space. And oftentimes it doesn't work, especially when you're trying to target a particular subset of that community. You need to understand their unique cultural inclinations. 
and I'm not talking about culture as per Yoruba, uh, Yoruba Hausa and so on. I'm talking about culture as per their idiosyncrasies, the way they think, the way they respond to issues. They need to understand their language. Uh, there's, there's this other issue about language. You see, you cannot come into Ikiti, for instance, and start speaking Hausa and expect that you're going to sell to the entire community. It's not going to work. So unless you're targeting just the Hausa community, and the same thing when you're talking about um, the digital community. You need to understand the language of that community. Uh, there's a lot of abbreviation. Uh, there are so many, so many abbreviations that come out these days, and I am I, I struggle to catch up. Like every day, I am I am on Google saying what is the meaning of this. But because you know my audience are in that particular community, that subset, and I need to catch up. I need to continue to talk to them in the language that they understand. And there's the currency. So we have the, the, the digital currencies, the bitcoins, the all those alternative coins, and all of those things. You have um, you also have the digitized local currencies. That's the that's the currency. So you cannot, uh, for instance, um, if this were a paid event, for example, you would it it would be an aberration. It would be an aberration for you or for um, the if it's a digital summit now. The organizers to say, okay, uh, go and pay into a bank account, snap the teller sent to us, then we will confirm. And no, that is, it's not going to work. A lot of people are just going to completely pull off this, the entire structure for that reason. Another thing that we need to consider uh, when you talk about the community is the nativity. So, uh, or rather citizenship, as some people would like to call it. Some people were born into this digital community. People like, like us, like particularly if you were born in the 80s to early 90s, uh, uh, yeah. It is late 70s to the 80s, to the late 80s. That's the generation that saw the introduction of all of these things. So um, I, I remember that while I was still trying to catch up with Game Boy, uh, Mario came. While I was still trying to catch up with Mario, uh, you know, uh, Cyber Cafes came in. While I was still trying to, it was still in this my generation. I'm not yet an old man. I'm still struggling to catch up with WWW. Then there's now, uh, I remember there was a Symbian, there was Java, there was, uh, and then Android came. The way the change is coming, it's head spinning. However, that is for someone like me, who, who also was in the generation that saw the black and white television and graduated into the color television. So it's head spinning for me because uh, I have to go through the, all the full range of change. But there is another generation that was born between 1995 to date. Those are the natives of the digital community. Those ones were born into it. So, the things that you struggle with are things that are natural to them. They cannot conceive a time when there was no internet in Nigeria. They can't imagine it. You know, it's like, how do you guys study? How do you guys communicate? I remember, we're also this last generation that sent handwritten letters. But last generation, so it's there's a lot of shifts. So they, you need to recognize that there are natives of this community. And you, got, you need to give them the credit that is due to them. Because they understand this community far better than you. They can play the economic space far better. And little wonder that in the digital economy, you find a lot of teenagers and early 20s who are doing fantastically well in the digital economy. Because they are the natives. They understand all these tools. All these things we are trying to learn now, they are things that they were born with. So you need to understand that they are natives and respect them accordingly. And it is inside all of that, then you now need to also understand the digital education and the digital platforms. The education system for um, within the digital community is far different from what we grew up, uh, you know, in. And I'll give you an example. If, for instance, uh, you want to you, you want to become an expert in any subject uh, whatsoever, in the uh, up to like last ten years, in fact, up to like five years ago, you would need to physically attend a university, physically attend a college, physically attend an educational institution and get a hard copy certificate to show that, yes, you are good at it. But you know that there is this generation now where you can become an expert in almost anything without stepping into the four walls of any school. And that is even still considering that there is a structured environment. Now, there's also the liberalized or to say the democratized educational system that allows you to just go on LinkedIn and take several courses. You can go on, uh, on any social media platform, follow any uh, expert in any field, and over time, by following and doing, you become an expert in that field, and you are recognized not by your certificate, or like, but like I used to like to say, but by your certificate. That is what, what you sabi. It is what you now know that determines um, your, your, your expertise. So we need to respect that and begin to tailor whatever business that we are doing to those platforms and to those uh, educational systems as they exist today. 
So for instance, if in Ekiti State, you want to sell, you want to make the whole world know, let's assume there is not a digital community yet, but it's a physical community and you enter into Ekiti State, you want the community of Ekiti State to know that you are selling good stuff. You probably do road shows, right? You will probably um, take your marketing materials to churches, to mosques, you know, to religious houses and to the traditional institutions. Because those were the platforms from which people get their information, the kind of endorsements that they get, that you get from that place will influence whether you are going to go find your business or not, whether the people will adopt uh, what you are selling, will come to you or not. You know, th those are the kind of platforms uh, and the educational systems that exist in a real, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the non-digital world, in non-digital community. Now bring that to the digital community. The endorsements that you need for your business to thrive are no longer in the hands of certain institutional individuals anymore. They are now in the hands of influencers. They are now in the hands of SEOs. You know, the things that you now need to get validation for your business, for whatever it is that you're doing, are now on different platforms and educational systems that have nothing to do with a human being, so to, so to speak. So that's, uh, you know, talking about the digital community. Uh, something that we also need to understand when we talk about, um, I, I've got to mention this during, in the ecosystem, the digital ecosystem, is that the ecosystem has certain features that we must respect as a business person. Um, one of which is precision. Um, the digital ecosystem does not respect guesswork. So you cannot afford to come into the field and say, I think this is what is working. You know, you, sometimes we joke about, um, we, we, we joke about mechanics in Nigeria, how you would go to a mechanics uh, workshop and it doesn't need to even touch your car to know what is wrong. You would just say, ah, eshinosi, epane, eshinosi, epane. And it's going to say that like four times. Or that will say, you alternator don't burn. You know, that is a very, 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 very crude way because that's just guesswork. I, I remember some time ago, I took my, my vehicle to one of those um, roadside uh, mechanics. And at the end of the day, it was pennywise pound foolish because it was a lot of guesswork so they removed this and said ah it must be this one that is the problem they removed it bought a new one and then this problem persisted and then they removed it and bought a new one now that's if that kind of approach does not work in the digital ecosystem you need to be precise because people are impatient don't forget that this is the generation that has seen rapid advancement in technology over the years so they are willing they are ready to move on as soon as you are not sure of what you're doing so there's precision, there is speed. So it's not only that you know exactly what you're doing, you must also be able to deliver the results quickly. As a matter of fact, uh, in thinking school, we say this is the generation that wants their solution provided to them before they started thinking of the problem. They expect that you as the expert should have anticipated that that problem is going to happen. And so the moment they say to you, hey, Shola, this is the problem I am facing, you say, yeah, I know, this is your solution. That is how much in a hurry this generation is. We are, no, we are not in that generation of, um, you know, I was talking to somebody about financial intelligence and I was talking about how our fathers used to build portfolios, you know, buy shares and try to own a company. Uh, the, this generation does not have patience for all of those things. We want to buy the shares, we want to buy the coins and see it appreciate within a few weeks and then roll it over, cash out, you know, and then move to the next big deal. That is how much in a hurry we are. And you need to respect that. You may want to talk about how that is not good morally. You may want to be moralistic about it. But the fact remains that that is a culture of this community. That's a culture of the natives of the digital community. And so if you are going to be selling to them, you need to respect that and play according to their rules because of the truth. The rules are theirs. You are only coming to sell to them and you have to play by their rules. Another factor is that there's a potential for security. You know, there's a potential for security. Uh, people want to know that they are... Um, their stuff are safe with you. So you know, there, there, there's data privacy. There is, um, um, I, I don't want to put my uh, my e-wallet, use my e-wallet on your platform or, or enter my credit card details on your platform and for that reason, lose my money. So no matter how good your business is, if that security is not guaranteed, the people are going to walk away from you because here, yeah, it's a digital world. So everything is digitized and we need to be sure that our digital assets are safe and secure even when we engage you. Another thing is that it makes uh, it makes the workplace lean. Everything is lean now. Like right now, um, I am in my house, but I'm in the studio in my in my in my office in my house. So in the same office, there's a library, there's a studio, there is um, my workstation is there. Like I have everything in one space. Before now, 
um, as far back as I say in 2015, 2016, what I have in this small space would have taken about four times of the space I'm currently using. And then I would have had to employ more people to do those these things for me. But now I have gone lean, excuse me, I've gone lean. Um, Thinking School has reduced its workforce you know, considerably simply because everything is digitized. Then growth is faster these days. But I also need to quickly add that there is a downside to it. It's lean, it means there's more task on one person. So you have to be your own graphic designer, you have to be your own media marketer, you have to be your own customer care person. You have to be basically like everything to your own self. So, so it, it has its own health implication. But within all of those things, we still need to acknowledge the fact that there's a benefit part of it. And then um, measurement is easier now. So it is easier for us to look at you and value who you are and what you are because practically everything is digital. Now, there was a time when if you wanted to audit a company, you would be dealing with tons and tons of paper. But now in the digital economy, digital community, you can audit a company, you can measure the growth of your company simply by clicking on a button or two because everything is on. So you just need to put in the metrics for your assessment and then your computer does the rest of it for you. So you can do like your evaluation within a few minutes as against taking weeks and months to get these things on. And then there's control. The people in the digital community want to have control at every point in time. So whatever it is that you do that make them feel like they are not in charge, they're going to walk away from you. Now, because of time, I'm just going to rush now and go to um, how all of these things um, impact our business. When we now start talking about the whole idea of the digital economy, the digital community, how does it impact our business? It impacts our business in several ways. As a matter of fact, I dare to say uh, it impacts our business in every single way from sourcing. You know, I was trying to list out um, all the ways it impacts our business, and I discovered that it was practically impossible for me to identify every single way that digital economy, that digitalization has impacted businesses. From the way you source for goods, there was a time when if you needed to buy anything, import anything into this country, you would physically travel to another country or physically travel to the location and then select the goods that you want, then uh, you know those things get sent to you. Sometimes you have to travel with your goods for you to get them. Now, sourcing is no longer that way. You can do everything online. Now, there's automation. It's not just that you can source by yourself online. You can also do your sourcing automatically by just clicking on the metrics, on the, on the indices that you're looking for, and then the computer does a short list for you. Uh, you know, th there, there are tools that do all of these things. So you can automate practically anything. Practically anything can be automated. There's conferencing, so you can have business like what we're having now. This summit ordinarily would have, uh, I would have to, have had to travel down from Abuja to Ekiti State, and then you know uh, maybe Muiwa would have had to travel down. A lot of people would have had to all come into uh, Ekiti State, which would have meant more manpower for the organizers. You know they would have had to have more people for logistics, people to take care of the guests, people to go and take care of the halls. They would, you know, several things. They would have to, had to employ more people. They would have had to pay for hotel, pay for feeding. There's so much that would have gone into this. But here we are. I'm facing my computer. You are facing your, your device also. And we are having a robust conversation simply because everything is digitized. Now there's collaboration. You can collaborate faster and better uh, because of this. You can Your payment systems can be integrated uh, you know, um, smoothly. As a matter of fact, um, one of the guys that we work with um, to, to scale up the business, you know, we had a conversation and then he was talking about how some of his clients are not even in Nigeria, you know, they're foreign, foreign clients. And he had to find a way of integrating um, digital currencies into his payment platforms. That was before the policy came out on, um, you know, prohibiting digital currencies and all of those things. So it, that's to show that um, payment has become seamless. It affects how payment has been done. People don't want to walk into banks anymore. We don't even want to do transfer anymore. I want to just be able to enter my details, click on a button or two, and then payment is done. I get validation. Um, because of digitization now, we now have what is called um, the escrow. The escrow system is smoother now. So I can, even if I don't know you, I can pay to a third party who holds the resources, who holds the funds until the money, the goods gets to me, and then I confirm receipt of the goods and then it releases the the, um, the funds to the to the vendor. Now that is something that ordinarily did not exist before. Now we can do all of those things. So business becomes easier and smoother. So it's uh, and, and I really look forward to um, a day when our local vendors will begin to use um, escrow systems. And probably this is a challenge to you, um, Shola, and you know the guys that do a lot of tech work to begin to create um, local escrow systems that can help 
the regular you know vendors to do business smoothly because it's there's there's a there's a bit of um, mistrust between the vendor and the buyer. The, the vendor does not want to release the goods, does not want to deliver the goods until he has received payment. The buyer does not want to pay until he has seen the goods. Easy way out, it's an escrow. It's somebody who is a third party who holds the funds until you have certified that the goods are satisfactory. And before the, the delivery guy leaves your doorstep, he releases the funds to the to the to the vendor. You know, that is that that's kind of uh, solves the whole entire problem of the mistrust. But then I digress a bit. Now, we also want to see a bit of guarantee and security. We want to be able to see that um, all that we are doing are protected. Yeah, there's, there's a guarantee on quality. There's a guarantee on, on, uh, on quantity as all that. So those are issues that the digital system would help you, the digital community, the digital economy can help you to, you know, to, to, um, to resolve or on the flip side can create a problem for you if you don't manage it well. Another thing is our labor and hiring systems. Um, once upon a time, you want to hire and then you put out an advert in the Vanguard, in the nation, and then people start to write a lot of, um, I, I hereby apply for, and then you have tons of paper to go through. Now, you can even apply for a job on Facebook by just clicking a button that says apply. You can go on LinkedIn and apply. You can do practically all your application process, your CV, your profile is already preloaded on these social media platforms. I just click a button and you have applied for it. The organization shortlists you. And may I also tell you that the organization oftentimes does not even use a human being to shortlist. Now there are systems that goes through your CV or your profile automatically looking for keywords. And once it finds those keywords, it just shortlists you. Keywords missing dumps into the digital trash. So. The, if we used to do the hiring system for, if you wanted to hire maybe 200 people before, and that could take you up to six months, now you can get your hiring done within a space of two days. That is how much the um, digital economy, the digital space has impacted on business up to hiring. Now, there is also, it has impacted on tourism. I'm just going to rush through the rest. Um, tourism, how we learn, how we seek knowledge, it has impacted on how we evaluate ourselves. How do we evaluate performance? It's Everything is digitized. How do we do get feedback? I remember, uh, you know, when I enter banks now and I see that suggestion box somewhere, it says, um, have we served you well? You know, it's, it's, it's just funny to me because all you just need to do is to have an app, you know, uh, installed either on your phone or somewhere at the door. I think Access, access Bank, okay, now that, that sounds like I'm advertising. There's a particular bank, <laughs> Access Bank, you know, did something like that. As you're stepping out of the bank, you just click on a button and the feedback is sent. You know, if you now need to take it further with details, then there is another system for you to do that. So this makes, so if you now start reaching out to your customers and say, please, I just want to find out, how do you find our service? And then you're calling. Remember, this is a, this is a generation that is impatient. The native loading community, they are impatient. So you waste their time, five minutes, talking to you about whether your business is impacting. You're not going to get any feedback. You're just going to say, yeah, it's all fine. And then when it's not fine, they walk away. It's as simple as that. It also impacts how we do our consulting, how we do our research and development. How do we schedule? So you want to deliver some items at a particular time. How do you do your scheduling? You have that there are apps, there are, there are platforms, there are tools for all of these things. How do you do you do your marketing? Um, Shola is, a, is an expert in digital marketing, you know. So he, he understands all of these things. There's, you can practically run an entire marketing system from your computer. Everything is digitized. You don't need to start looking for boys and girls to go and dance on the street to market your goods and your service for you. You can do everything. Facebook takes it to them. YouTube takes it to them. Um, you know, Google, every, you know, these guys, these, these platforms are there to help you take your messages directly to the people that are most relevant to your business. Before now, we used to do a lot of guesswork. I remember um, some time ago, we wanted to market some, um, a new service in the state. We practically had to print thousands of flyers and we're depositing in churches, we deposited in banks, we deposited in eateries, just for people to see. And we knew that all the customers we needed were just about 100 people for us to survive. But we did not know who the 100 people were. So we had to send out flyers to tens of thousands of people with the hope that the 100 people we need will come to us. But with digital marketing, these platforms, these apps take them directly to the most relevant people. And you can track, so you, you can save money and get far more results in shorter time. Then it affects our profiling. You can easily profile your, your customers. You can profile your, 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 your clients to determine um, what category. You know, uh, uh, worked, uh, Thinker School worked recently, or not so recently, 2019, we worked with a particular organization that needed to streamline its customers' needs. 
and be able to serve them faster and better. And all we needed to do was to put up some tools, you know, so as you're coming in, the cashier is just, um, you know, the few questions that you're asked that you're asked, some of the things that you're saying, they're just putting them in. Oh, so you bought this today, you bought that today. It creates a profile. It's a parent, it's a um, mid-20s, it's this, it's that. So there's a profile. There's like an avatar created for almost every single customer. So when you're introducing a new good, they're introducing a new service, just target a particular customer profile and send the market to them and the, the marketing materials to them. Surprise, surprise, they were able to hit their targets faster because about 80% of the people that they had profiled and identified as people that needed these goods came back to buy simply because they were able to profile correctly. Now, if you were going to do profiling in the past, you know, it's, you're going to um, engage a lot of consultants, you're going to pay a lot of money for you to do all of those things. As you say, it impacts on our entertainment, it impacts on the way we get funding, it impacts on... Uh, or, you know, on documentation, on transportation, on workflow management, very important. On workflow management, it impacts on it also. You know, so it's easy for me, for instance, now that we do a lot of remote working, it, it's, it's, it's easy for me now to sit down here in Abuja. My project manager is in Abuja with me, but um, like several streets away. My, um, the, the digital guy, the guy that does all the designs for us is in Adoikiti. As well as this year alone, he has traveled like several states, and from wherever he is, he gets the job done. And we can track who is working, who is doing what, simply because we have a tool that uh, helps us to manage our workflow effectively. On the flip side, on the flip side, there are also some things that digitization has impacted negatively in, the biz in our businesses. But this is not to say that we should abandon digitization. It is for us to be aware that these weaknesses exist and then begin to find a way to plug those weaknesses to ensure that we don't you know, run foul of those things. It, there's increased criminality, particularly when it comes to fraud, forgery. It's easier. You know, back um, some, of, some time ago, if you need to um, forge something, you had to particular, physically go to a particular location that I'm not going to mention, a uh, you know, very notorious place, and then they would do all the forgery for you. you know, the place became very notorious at some point. But now people sit on their computers and forge basically anything. I'm not going to tell you tools that they use, you know, because I'm not going to encourage criminality and all that. But the bottom line is that that's a risk that digitization has brought. So you really need to be careful. So you need to find a way of securing and double securing whatever it is that you're doing. I was talking to uh, with, with a friend of mine recently that does a, bit of, a, a lot of tech work. And I was talking about how, uh, you know, this e-wallet thing, how people were beating the system and were making multiple withdrawals and all of those, you know. And there and then we started discussing on ways of beating you know, that's weakness. So it, it's it's a reality that we need to, as business owners, begin to um, find ways to ensure that these things don't affect us. Um, it also impacts on fraud. Now there's increased fraud because of the digital. Uh, Some time ago, um, a popular um, ride hailing service was hacked and the accounts of people, there was mass withdrawal of funds from people's accounts that were linked to that hack. Um, the, uh, so they had to, you know, find a way of ensuring that that does not happen again. The same thing, there's this um, savings and investment app also. I'm sure a lot of you are, are, are familiar with these stories. I don't want to mention names, you know, but you're familiar with some of these things I'm talking about. Hey, these, are, these are the real risks that exist. There's, um, the, there's also the risk of privacy. You know, I talked about data protection and privacy. There's also increased um, risk of terrorism. So now we now have economic terrorism. We have economic sabotage. Everything happening on the screen of a laptop. You know, um, there's also the problem of corruption and money laundering. So it has become more intense, more, um, uh, you know, more, much more difficult to track because of the advent of um, digital technology. That's not inter interaction has suffered. Uh, like I said, you may not walk into a banking hall for the rest of your life. You don't have a problem with your account. You know, so, so now that removes personal interaction. You will, not, you will find um, sometimes just walk into some of these um, restaurants and you will find four people sitting around the table waiting for their food to be served and they are all chatting away. They are not talking to one another, but they are on their phones, you know, talking to somebody who is far away. So this is um, th th these are risks that come that affects the business. You know, there, there was a time when if you were a businessman, you want to know the bad days of your, of your people, of your customers and clients, you want to send them personalized gifts and all those things. It's, it's no longer, well, there's, there's this generation, people like me, I appreciate that, I so personalize it, I get it, but I, I appreciate it. But there's a generation that is coming, that is here already, that those things don't really work with. So you need to understand that personal interaction is dying. 
that's a risk. Um, family time is almost completely gone. Uh, you know, you know, because everybody is online at every point in time. You want you're trying to catch up on what's the latest trend, what's the latest hashtag, what are the latest tools available for your business. You're trying to catch up with your customers. Yeah, there's always something to do online at every point in time. Relationships are suffering. Health is suffering also. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to um, drop that because it's it's how it impacts our business is so broad. Now you will note that I have not said this is what you should do, and it's deliberate because you see there is no silver bullet to to, to, the, to the question of the digital economy. But what you need to understand is how the digital economy impacts on you. What are the tools that affect um, uh, you know what are the tools that you need to start using, and then can begin to um, create strategies that helps you to leverage on these tools to create the environment that allows the natives, allows people to engage your business appropriately. Now we'll move to terms, and that's uh, we're going to be closing in the next two or three slides. Familiar terms. Um, a lot of us are familiar with social media, teleconferencing, cloud computing, digital marketing. If you are not familiar with these terms, if you don't know these terms yet, then there's a big problem. Because even these things, are about to be taken for granted. So you need to move, you need to quickly begin to learn these things now, master them, because we are going into another set of um, terms and concepts that are completely strange to a lot of us. And these are data science. Issues are data science, you need to be familiar with data science, you need to know blockchain, you need to build your business around artificial intelligence, machine learning, the internet of things, virtual interaction, virtual reality, robotics, quantum computing. These are concepts that in Nigeria, a lot of us, I'm sure if you ask anybody, most of us here about blockchain, the only thing we know is Bitcoin. When we talk about blockchain, that's what we know. But the reality is that blockchain is far more than just the currencies. We talk about artificial intelligence, you know. So there's so much that we need to learn. And to, oh, okay, so I have got 15 more minutes um, to take questions. Um, so at this, at this junction, I'm just going to... Um, because I was going to talk about how government policy and regulation comes to play, but I'll leave that since um, the session after mine is going to be is going to talk about positioning the United States. So I, I expect that the government um, is going to cover government policy and all of those other um, aspects of the conversation. So at this junction, I'm just going to um, stop and um, allow you to ask questions, and then uh, we can take it further from there. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, Shola. Uh, oh, Shola, you're muted. Oh, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> hey, guys, I, I said you should drop your favorite emoji for our speaker, you know, to appreciate our speaker. Sorry, I was muted. I didn't know that. All right, drop your favorite emoji in the comment section. Let us know um, that you appreciate our speaker. Someone says um, that you are a very great teacher. This person, oh, well, yeah, I think you can say the speaker is a teacher. <laughs> you know, that watch and you're looking at there is clapping. Um, but thank you. you know, YouTube is looking at it as watch and then um away the same away I say a very good teacher and uh I do where Mimo says uh to um uh, I do where we are to look I say wow and um okay say this is mind blowing and uh Ola Yonju Ola me they say we can oh okay you can hear me now so guys drop your questions right now if you have any question for the speaker you can quickly drop your questions in the comment section. We'll be looking at the comment section to um, take your question. Okay, please, uh, we have a question from o Education for Life TV. Uh, says, does one really need to learn all these skills? Data science, you know, you mentioned data science, that these are the things that we are going to the next phase of it, especially in Nigeria. But does one need to really learn all of these skills? This is what um, education, um, education for life, I would really love that you mention your name so that we don't just be saying education for life, all right? When you are asking questions, especially if you are not using your personal YouTube channel. Um, okay, maybe you might want to answer that question, sir. 
Uh, okay, so uh, <laughs> yes, the, the, the question, do we need to learn all these skills? You may not become a master of all of them, but you need to know them. Uh, I, I consider myself part of the old school. You know, as much as I try to keep up with what is going on, the, the instructive word is that I try to keep up. I am not amongst those people that are masters of these things. But in all these things, you need to know a bit of, you know, what is data science, how to use it, what data science can do for you, what big data actually can do for you, what blockchain can do for you, what um, artificial intelligence can do for you. With this understanding, then you are now able to determine um, whether it is something, and basically every single thing that you need to learn, you can learn online. It is when you now need more expertise, when you begin to tap into the benefits of this set of knowledge, and you realize that, okay, the little that you know is no longer sufficient, then you now know when to bring in an expert to help you to you know, scale up the solutions that you need. So you need to learn all these things, yes, at the, uh, at the basic level, but you need to become a master of all of them. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think you need to be a master of all these things. Amazing. So at the basic level, you don't have the knowledge of what these things are about, not just, just ignore it, you know. So make sure that you have the knowledge of all, what these things are about. And if you can learn them, it's an opportunity for you to, you know, tap into the digital space. All right. Um, Okay, Desi Cakes and Moss, Janet Alana, you say thank you so much for, for that intelligent teaching. And a lot of people are actually saying they enjoy your lecture. Uh, Adeni Ron Camilu says, honestly, I enjoyed the lecture. God bless you, sir. Amen. God bless you. Panto, uh, Nas, Isaac. Okay, while, while we're going to that, I, I don't know. Maybe you might just want to share a bit of, you know, you wanted to talk about government policy before we, um, before I kind of stop you. But as you're getting into that, let me quickly read some comment section. Um, Topia Akin Tayo says, how digital economy impact businesses now? Okay, he's talking about, uh, you know, just more like what you have said. Um, DIY sourcing made easy. Yeah, that's DIY sourcing made easy. Automation of activities, virtual conferences, yes. And Adeni Ron says, honestly, okay, I enjoyed the session. God bless you. Uh, there is also talk. Okay, this person says, Florence. It's you know who I say I actually forgot that I was watching online. Thought I was seated in front of my teacher. <laughs> okay, that was awesome. I, it's actually true. You know, I told you earlier that um, Coach Mike is a great teacher. Is someone that I respect a lot. All right, so you might want to touch on the government policy a bit before we, you know, draw the curtain um, on this line. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so. When we talk about the, the digital community, so just like every community, there is governance, there are policies and laws, you know, there's, there are issues of privacy, there are infrastructural needs that sustain that, um, that community, that environment. So we need now to begin to engage the government system to understand, and to, quite frankly, you know, uh, in Nigeria, we, we are still very much analog when it comes to governance. Yes. You know, yeah. so uh, uh, and at, at the risk of whatever, I'm going to say um, here that it was strange to me that any government in this age would ban digital currency or hmm. ban, you know, uh, uh, um, social communication at any level, whether it's call it suspension, ban, restriction, whatever name you call it, because the reality is that. People need to continue to converse. People need to continue to grow. People need to continue to, you know, to have the space to continue to expand this digital community. And so when you say, stop doing some of these things that are integral to that community, what you are saying is, hey guys, let's go back to the stone age. Okay, um, I, I, was, I was going to become a bit of an activist there, but let's come back to the conversation. We need, we need, to, we need, to, we need government to now begin to, you know, take the lead, so to say, on creating policies that enables this community. If uh, during, after the World War, after the um, Second World War, the governments of countries, have had governments in blocks of nations began to set aside funds, began to come up with policies that um, en engendered quick developments, speedy development and renovation of the places that were affected by these things. We need to begin to have that same approach to the development of 
the digital community. Government needs to begin to not just pay lip service to these things. They need to begin to set aside policy and funds to support this. We need policies that are favorable. As of today, our data policy is not up to scratch. Our data protection policy is not up to scratch. Intellectual, intellectual property protection rights online in the cyberspace is nothing to write home about. So these are issues that you and I as individuals cannot solve. These are things that are you know, solely in the, uh, in the ambits of the government. Now, we also need to begin to look at what is our internet infrastructure like? Hmm. I remember in 2017 when I wanted to join, wanted to join calls with some of my, uh, my, my clients that are outside the country, I spent about 30% of the time saying, can you hear me? Hello, are you there? Can you hear me? Because the internet is unstable. You know, yeah. at that time I was investing yeah. heavily in internet. So I had uh, all three networks. I'm not going to mention them, the red, the green, and the other ones, you know, <laughs> and all three of them. But I was using, because if one flops, I need to quickly switch to the other one because these guys cannot just imagine that there's any place on it that network is unstable, you know? So internet infrastructure, we need to take it very, very seriously. And I think I want to throw a challenge out right now to, um, to the state government, because this is the digital summit, you know? I, I know, Shola, you've been doing a lot of work on, on this on this component, but just to uh, make it also very, uh, public and to throw the challenge to the government, we need to begin to have, not just, uh, we need to begin to have innovation corridors. We need to have like a, a zone, even if you cannot make the whole of it, it's a state have stable internet. We need to begin to have zones where it is you are guaranteed of stable internet, stable electricity, security, you are free from harassment and molestation by the security forces. These are things that we cannot do by ourselves. These are things that only the government can do for us. We, we also There's also the in place of electricity infrastructure. So yeah. we need to have yeah. stable electricity. You know, When I started doing remote work, I had to invest heavily in solar power. I have to invest heavily, you know, because I could not imagine as we are talking now, never takes light. And rush outside, my light is going to go off, you know, everything just goes blank. No matter how much the things flow, mm. at that point, I'm mm. going to get disoriented. You are going to lose interest. Now people are going yeah. to log off. So we need stable, consistent, reliable electricity for us to tap into this digital economy, this digital community effectively. We also need to begin to engage our telecom service providers. You know, uh, recently we I had a project I was um, I am midwifing for a client, and okay. uh, we had to engage some of these telecom uh, companies. And I was shocked to realize that these guys can actually give us internet for free. You know, no, 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 no. Sorry, sorry, that was a mistake. Okay, okay so I, I I realized that these guys could actually because when we were negotiating the issues of internet. We stopped talking about data. You know, we're not talking about data cap anymore. We're not talking about speed. That was what they were selling. Because the internet will now become unlimited. And then it's only the speed that you now have to pay more for. This is something that if they can just, if the telecoms guys, if we are really serious about developing this country in the digital space, then we need to start, stop selling data volume. Let's start selling speed. Mm. Let's, start selling, let's start selling speed. That's what, that's what we need. You know, we, we also need to begin to look at what's our information management system. So you are trying to engage the government, for instance, and then you write to, uh, uh, you know, maybe to the Ministry of Finance. And that's what comes easily to my head because the Commissioner of Finance is the next person to speak after me. You know, so you write to the Ministry of Finance, you get some information. And they, they, because the information is not with the Ministry of Finance, you know, after weeks of waiting, they now write back to you to say, oh, this information is not with us. We suggest that you should write to the Minister of Trade. And then you write to trade. Trade says, oh, this function is not with us. You write to logistics. You know, and then they keep pushing you, and it takes like a month for each one of them to respond to find out that it's not with them. Why don't you have an information management system within the government? That once you send out an email, can you just shoot an email to any random person? And then whoever it is that is, you know, relevant to that, to that information that you seek, just responds to you. The same way it is done in banks. The same way it's done in most of all these um, big cops. And it's not impossible. We need to begin to have this kind of conversations within government. And then the last two are intellectual property rights. Okay. Am I safe, you know, saying that the content that I put online, if someone else should use my content, is there, uh, the, the, is the judiciary equipped enough to protect my intellectual property rights? Or do I have to go all out and do so much more 
Uh, this, this also forms, falls within my own jurisdiction, you know, as, as a lawyer uh, playing in the justice in the justice sector. But these are all issues that affect the digital community because nobody. I, I want to be sure that my codes are, are, are internet, uh, intellectually uh, intellectual property protected. I want to be sure that the codes I write because any any jack can reverse engineer the codes that I that I write, create a competition. After I have done years of research to come up with that product or service, some smart guy will just pick my codes reverse engineer it and create a competition. Now, if he's lucky to have a money bag backing him up, he's going to overtake everything that I have done within the last seven, 10 years, in just two years. So we need to begin to have this kind of policies and protection. What are the emerging techs, the technologies that are available? These are, these are all things that the government has a role to play to ensure that the community grows and the economy blossoms. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, you're muted, Shola. Uh, Shola, you're muted. My Lord. <laughs> All right, I want to say that thank you so much, sir. And like I said, our, you know, I've jotted a lot down and our content team are working, uh, you know, to, you know, note all the things that you are talking about. And let me appreciate, let me use this opportunity to appreciate Topia Akintayo for doing an amazing job in the comment section. Uh, that is the head of our content development team. And Jessica Olori, uh, thank you so much. Like you said, you know, Tokwe Akintayo is not even Nikiti and he's heading our content development team. In fact, the person who is also uh, handling our social media management is not also in Nikiti, right? And we also have some people who have volunteered, even from UK, you know, as part of our team. So that is um, you, you, what you uh, talked about is actually profound. Um, someone asked a question here. Oh, well, yeah, I did okay. A quick one before we move um, is says that. How does digital collaboration got to do with security organizations in Nigeria? I don't know um, if that question is for you. And then let me just take the, the last question so that we can, you can just answer the question um, at the same time and then we can then wrap up. And uh, this person, Olayan Ju, Olami, they say, sir, I think the major constraint to digital growth in Nigeria is largely dependable on the government policies. Please, how can we solve this um, issue? All right, so that is, um, all I on Jews questions. So those are the, just the two questions that we'll be taking and then we can round up from there. Okay, so I'm going to start from the second one because I see I have just two minutes to, to wrap up. Um, the yeah. second one, digital, um, uh, the second one has to do with government. Is it all about government and then what can we do as individuals? i just give you an example. I don't have stable electricity where I am, so I invested in solar power. And it, trust me, solar power, you don't even need a millionaire to invest in solar power. As something as uh, I, I know that there are tools that gives you for as low as 70,000 naira, 100,000 naira, and you can collaborate. You know, you can have two, three people come together and invest in these things, and then that gives you stable electricity. Excuse me. We need to begin to look at um, a, a situation where people who are not necessarily very wealthy, but people who are interested and have a, a little extra cash to spare, begin to invest in shared spaces. I know Shola does something fantastic in that regard. I know uh, quite a number of people. So begin to invest in those shared spaces where you can then, um, you know, have your or have your infrastructure situated in one place, and then you just pay a token to subscribe to it. That helps you to solve, uh, you know, some of those problems. There's internet, there's electricity, there's furniture, there's security. You know, all those things that you would ordinarily have had to pay for one by one. Now you can have oh, yeah. it, like so a community. Sorry, I'm so sorry, sir. We just. <laughs> Uh, because of time, right? I'm so sorry. I know that uh, you, it will have been so um, amazing that you answer those questions. Guys, most of the things that you even asked is already answered uh, in this presentation. And we already have the Honorable Commissioner um, in, at the backstage. So I will, uh, you know, we just have to move on with the program and it's, um, it's up time. So, sir, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Barrister Mike Olani, for this amazing presentation. You did so much well. And I want to say, you know, if we invite you for another session, I hope that you are going to respond to us, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you know, you're not going to respond. Thank you so Absolutely. much, sir. Thank you. And we hope that we can get the slides so that we can share with um, uh, our, you know, participants later on. Of course, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. And God bless you. We'll see you on the other side, sir.
God bless you. Amen. All right, guys. So we have with me right now at the back end, um, the Earning Commissioner for Finance and Economic Development. At, on the next screen right now, you're going to see him. Do well to invite your friends, you know, and if you have any question, please drop those questions in time so that we can have those questions.